स्थापकाय सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णाय ते नम So today we will start a new chapter, the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, is a master and Vijay Goswami. Thursday, December 14, 1882. It was afternoon. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on his bed after a short noonday rest. Vijay, Balaram, Aim, and a few other devotees were sitting on the floor with their faces towards the master. They could see the sacred river Ganges through the door. Since it was winter, all were wrapped up in warm clothes. Vijay had been suffering from colic and had brought some medicine with him. Vijay and Vijay the Brahma preacher. Vijay was a paid preacher in the Sadharan Brahma Samaj, but there were many things about which he could not agree with the Samaj authorities. He came from a very noble family of Bengal, noted for its piety and other spiritual qualities. Advaita Goswami, one of his remote ancestors, had been an intimate companion of Sri Chaitanya. Thus, the blood of great lover of God flowed in Vijay's veins. As an adherent of the Brahma Samaj, Vijay no doubt meditated on the formless Brahman, but his innate love of God, inherited from his distinguished ancestors, had merely been waiting for the proper time to manifest itself in all its sweetness. Thus, Vijay was irresistibly attracted by the God-intoxicated state of Sri Ramakrishna and often sought his company. He would listen to the master's words with great respect and they would dance together in an ecstasy of divine love. It was a weekday. Generally, devotees came to the master in large numbers on Sundays. Hence, those who wanted to have intimate talks with him visited him on the weekdays. Tendencies, tendencies from previous births. A boy named Vishnu living in Ariyadaho had recently committed suicide by cutting his throat with a razor. The talk turned to him, Master. I felt very badly when I heard of the boy's passing away. He was a pupil in a school and he used to come here. He would often say to me, that he couldn't enjoy worldly life. He had lived with some relatives in the western provinces and at the and that time used to meditate in solitude in the meadows, hills and forests. He told me he had visions of many divine forms. Perhaps this was his last birth. He must have finished most of his duties in his previous birth. The little that had been left undone was perhaps finished in this one. So here we find an instance when a boy is committing suicide. But very interesting, he find here that Sri Ramakrishna is indicating that he was a highly spiritually exalted soul. He had realized the spiritual goal in this life. Now in Vedanta, in our Hindu dharma, in Sanatan dharma, from long back in our scriptures, the euthanasia is prescribed. Nowadays we say that a patient, an elderly patient who wants to die willingly is allowed to do that. It's legal. In, Vedan, in Vedantic tradition, in our Sanatan dharma, they, this was legal. Euthanasia was legal. But there's a condition. It's not for all. It is a illegal thing. It is an unethical thing 
if anyone commits suicide who have not realized the spiritual goal in this life. It's not because that I'm suffering from illness or because of old age, I have the right to commit suicide. That was not prescribed. But if you are spiritually realized so, that's the goal of life. Once you have attained, you can commit suicide and various ways have been prescribed. You can jump from a mountain, you can dive deep into the river. There are so many ways that were prescribed Sri Ramakrishna used to give a nice example that why this human body? It is for the attainment of spiritual realization. Sharira madhyam khalu dharma sadhanam. This body is meant for the attainment of the spiritual goal in life. The dharma has two meanings. Dharma means dharyateti dharma, that which integrates us. And another meaning of dharma is Vishishyate iti dharma. There's two meanings of dharma. For us in general, dharma means dharyate iti dharma. That which helps us to integrate our life. The religion gives us a certain framework to bind our life within that. And that's how it religiates. The word religion came from religiate. Religiate means to bind. That helps us to integrate us. That's one meaning which is applicable for most of us. But there is another meaning of the word dharma. It means vishishyate. The unique characteristic of a thing is its dharma. Just like the dharma of water is to flow. The dharma of fire is to give heat. Similarly, as a human being, we have certain uniqueness which no other creature have. What is that? As a human being in the gospel, many times Sri Ramakrishna is think, saying that we can think of God. No other creatures can do that. We can contemplate on the divine. We can think of our spiritual dimension of our existence. No one can do that. And not only that, we can realize that spiritual dimension of existence. And that's the dharma, uniqueness of the human birth. It's not the sensate pleasures of life. We, with our modern technology, think that we, with our technology, can intensify the sense pleasures of life, and that is the goal of life. No. With all our technology, can I ever even imagine to enjoy a meal just the way a dog enjoys its meals? No. Its senses are very, very keen. It's very tuned to a very high frequency. That's why we use them in the criminal sites to smell. They have a tremendous capacity to smell, to taste, to hear. The birds can hear from sitting here in our center, the ocean is far away. I cannot hear the rumbling of the waves, but the birds can hear. They can hear this very low frequency sounds. They have their range of this aud audible their, this audible range is much, much higher than us. So the senses of the animals are much keen. They are much more intensified the way they enjoy the sensed pleasures of life. We humans with all our technology can never, can never enjoy the senses the way the animals does. That is not our uniqueness. Our uniqueness is our capacity to think of the spiritual dimension of existence and to realize that. And once we have done it, the purpose of the human birth is done. And then euthanasia is applicable for you. Yes, it is prescribed. It is legal. And that's why we find Sri Ramakrishna is saying that he was a spiritually illumined soul. Though he was a small boy, most probably in the previous birth, his samskaras has enabled him to attain the spiritual heights in this birth at a very early age. And his purpose of life is served. So now if he commits suicide, it is not an heinous act. It is prescribed, it is allowed. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a wonderful example that in Ayurveda, in Kaviraja, there is a medicine called Makaradhvaja. So this Makaradhvaja 
how to prepare in a bottle, various liquid ingredients has to be mixed. They're all liquids. You have to pour them, all those liquid ingredients you pour in the bottle, and then you have to keep it aloof so that the liquids, when they all mix together in a few days, they crystallize. They become solid, hard, crystallize. Now that's the medicine, Makarat Dhoja, that strong, solid, uh, crystallized uh, ingredients all together, conglomeration of all those ingredients is the medicine. But it is inside the bottle. How can I get that medicine? You have to break the bottle to get the medicine. So Sri Ramakrishna is, said is, is to say that once the crystallization has happened, there's no use for the bottle. Now you can break it. So the purpose of the human birth is to attain that spiritual illumination. Once you have done whether it stays or you can willingly give it, there is no harm in it. It is allowed. It is prescribed. Many of us equate spirituality with all those yoga. Yoga doesn't mean, and nowadays we loosely translate yoga as the asanas and pranayamas, which are intended for longevity of life. And many equate spirituality with the longevity of life. Oh, he is living for 120 years. He must be very spiritual. Good life. He is living. Swami Vivekananda have very nicely indicated. If the longevity is a sign of spirituality, then the banyan tree is the most spiritual. For thousand years it stays, lives. But the banyan tree, after living for thousand years, is just a banyan tree. A tortoise, for hundreds of years it may live, but it's just a tortoise. A human being, who is a fool after spiritual realization, he becomes an illumined soul, a saint. He's a transformed. He's no more an ordinary person. He has realized the purpose of life. And for that is the human birth, not to live for 120 years. If you can do it in 20 years, 30 years, well and good. Your purpose has been served. Now you can live off the body because that body purpose has been served. And that's the thing which has been indicated by Sri Ramakrishna. The next, that what he just let us read those uh, these words again. I felt very badly when I heard of the boys passing away. He was, of course, sad because he loved, loved that boy. But next, the few lines is very interesting. He was a student in a school and he used to come here. He would often say to me that he couldn't enjoy worldly life. He had lived with some relatives in the Western provinces, and that and that time used to meditate in solitude, in the meadows, hills, and forests. He told me he had visions of many divine forms. This speaks of his spiritual attainments. There's two signs are there. What are there? Ishware Anurag, Vishay Virag. Your attachment towards the divine, towards the devotion towards the divine, and detachment. Or attachment towards God and detachment towards the world. That two things he has attained. He was having visions big, and he was always in that communion with the divine and he has developed a distaste for this worldly life. He cannot enjoy it anymore. The purpose has been served and perhaps that was his last birth. He is, the purpose of his being born is, is, has been served. There is no more need to continue. He must have finished most of his duties in his previous birth. He have done them. There's this and the samskaras, the good samskaras made him to realize the spiritual truth just in the early age. Sri Ramakrishna in a very funny way used to say that if you see someone at a very early age without much practices, develop spirituality, you know, it is what it is like what? That you may say how at such a young age he has developed so much spiritual qualities. Sri Ramakrishna very jokingly in, a, in his funny way, in his uh, jovial mood, he used to give a very nice allegory. Suppose early in the morning, you find a person totally drunk. He cannot walk properly. And people saw him just have a small pig. Morning he got up, he had a small pig and he was totally uh, what is it, this uh, has lost his control. He cannot even walk properly. 
So people were amazed, just having such a small quantity of alcohol. Can anyone become so intoxicated? And then it was found, actually he was drinking throughout the night. He needed just that small peg to really lose his balance. So that's the example Sri Ramakrishna used to give in the gospel, very funny ways to say. So he had done all things which has to be done in his previous birth. Just a little was remaining. And that was done at the quite early age. And now the purpose of the human birth is served. So now he has the right to give away his life willingly. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating here. One, of, one must admit the existence of tendencies inherited from previous births. There is a story about a man who practiced the Sava Sadhana. Sava Sadhana means uh, that on the, you will be sitting on the death bo dead body. The dead body is your asana. You were sitting on that to practice. It is a, a tantric way of meditation. So why these are done? To contemplate on the this ephemeral life. This life is not permanent. We all have to meet this end. So that becomes your asana. To contemplate on the this transitoriness of this world. I still remember as a brahmachari, I visited the Tara pit. There's, there's a Shakti. It is a, one of the Shakti pits, Maha pit. And there, uh, there is that cremation ground where we have heard that many of the sadhakas there do sava sadhana. They sit on the dead body and do throughout the night do spiritual practice. So as I was there in the night, I had a curiosity. So I, with some few other associates, with few other swamis, went to visit that cremation ground and nowhere found any of those sadhakas. There were many sadhakas, there were many spiritual practitioners, but no one was sitting on the corpse. They were just meditating, sitting on the ground. So naturally, uh, out of curiosity, we asked one of them that we have heard that here you all do sav sadhana. You sit on the corpse and meditate, but we find no one is doing that. And what the answer he gave is very interesting. Well, we are all sitting on the sava, corpse. What? Well, this ground you see, this soil, it is all for thousands of years. These living creatures have died and decomposed, and that has become this soil. The soil is the sava. It's the sava. So we always try to contemplate on that fact that everything is ephemeral. The soil on which you are si sitting speaks of those decomposed biological entities, whether it is plants, flora or fauna, maybe plants or animals that have decomposed and become the soil. So that speaks of the sava. So they say you are sitting on the sava means you constantly contemplate on the transitoriness that God alone is real. Everything is temporary. So he was doing a sava sadhana. It is a, practice, it is a spiritual practice in the tantra. So he worshipped the Divine Mother in deep forest. First he saw many terrible visions. Finally, a tiger attacked and killed him. Another man happening to pass and seeing the, uh, sorry, another, uh, another man happening to pass and seeing the approach of the tiger had climbed a tree. Afterwards, he got down and found all the arrangements for worship at hand. He performed some purifying ceremonies and seated himself on the corpse. No sooner had he done a little japa than the Divine Mother appeared before him and said, My child, I am very much pleased with you. Accept a boon from me. He bowed low at the lotus feet of the goddess and said, May I ask you one question, Mother? I'm speechless with amazement at your action. The other man worked so hard to get the ingredients for your worship and tried to propitiate you for such a long time, but you didn't condescend to show him your favor. And I, who don't know anything of worship, who have done nothing, who have neither devotion nor knowledge nor love, and who haven't practiced any austerities, I'm receiving so much of your grace. The Divine Mother said with a laugh, my child, 
you don't remember your previous births. For many births, you tried to propitiate me through austerities. As a result of those austerities, all these things have come to hand and you have been blessed with my vision. Now ask me your boons. So that's a so nice story. That the same idea that uh, very nicely in Bhagavad Gita it has been mentioned that neha abhikramana shosti pratyavaya navidyate. It is the 40th verse in the second chapter. Swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. What it speaks of? That you know, in our day to day life, suppose I am constructing a house, my house, and have just constructed it is just half complete and my funds are over and I find I am in debt. I cannot continue with the work. So what has happened? Two things have happened. The work wouldn't be completed. That it is half complete. I cannot use that house. It is not completed. And another thing, all the monies I have lost. Whatever money I had, I lost and I am in debt. So these two things. Abhikrama speaks of sequence. That if I do, do not complete all the sequence, I do not attain the goal. And Pratyavaya means the ill effects are there. What is the ill effect? That whatever money I had, it's all gone. Now I'm a pauper. So in worldly life, if you cannot do not achieve the goal, then there's a waste of time. All the time, you can you have neither achieved the goal, you have wasted your resource, you have wasted your time. But what in Bhagavad Gita is they saying? This there is no whatever spiritual practice you do, know it for certain, even if you have not completed. It is not a waste. It is not that that's abhikram, you are not going to attain the goal. Whatever you have done, it remains as samskar. It remains as your latent impressions. And these latent impressions, no one can erase in this life or on some other life. Again, when you get favorable circumstances, these latent impressions will manifest. Just you have to get the favorable circumstances. Then again, these latent impressions, whatever, wherever you have left, they will get strengthened. And again, you will start from there. It's not that you're going to lose. If what I have studied in this life, like all the literature, everything, that I may forget. I will forget. I will again have to start from alphabets. But, the, uh, the, the, but my urge to learn, that no one can take away from me. My, so we will find that a child prodigies. What, that as, as a child, they start learning very quickly. It's not that, that as they have learned everything in the previous birth, so in this birth, from the very first day, they know the alphabets. No, they also have to learn. They forget everything. But one thing is there, as they have developed that tendency, that, that uh, tendency, that uh, some scars, the latent impressions to learn, there was a passion for learning that no one can take away. That's why this child, as a small child, we find as he has a tremendous passion for learning, very quickly he's picking up all the things that no one can take away. So here also in spiritual uh, journey, whatever practices I have done as a latent impression, as my devotion, it remains. The moment I get favorable circumstances in some future life, immediately they start manifesting and take me towards the goal very fast. And that's the thing Sri Ramakrishna is indicating into this story, that he has done a lot of things. Just the moment all the favorable circumstances were there, he just sat down and just did a little japa, immediately the Divine Mother was there to give her the boons, ready. Then nature will conspire to make your desire fulfilled. That's the boon of the Divine Mother. The nature will conspire. If you have any desire, intense desire, know it for certain. The plan of the universe is such. It has to be fulfilled. If you desire anything, know it for certain today or tomorrow, it has to be fulfilled. The plan of the nature is such. So this sadhaka, this other second person must have, must have done the spiritual practices in his past birth. And 
that remained as samskar. The moment he gets the favorable circumstances, immediately they manifest. He makes his meditation so intense in a short time, it takes him to the realization immediately. So Ramakrishna used to give this, Ramakrishna is the master of examples. He used to say, suppose a gardener is just uh, digging the soil of his garden, he's stealing the land, and accidentally he never knew there was a uh, water, there was a pipe, underground, this pipe of water, he never knew. And accidentally he stuck, his ax stuck the pipe and the water as fountain started coming out. So we don't know. There are so many good tendencies hidden like that water pipe, the pipe of water within our subconscious mind. We don't know. In this birth, we are not aware of them. Though we are not aware of them, but they are always there. They are always waiting for the favorable circumstances to sprout. That why we don't, uh, if we are not aware of the past tendencies, that with an example we can understand that why we never remember the all the things of the past. All our past samskaras are there, latent impressions are there, but we are not aware of them. Just suppose take consider a room where all the doors and windows are closed. It's dark. And then with a projector, you project some video or some picture on the screen, on the wall. And it's very, very prominently visible, that picture. And now you suddenly open all the doors. Can you see that picture anymore? No. So what happens? That, that picture is there. Picture is there on the screen. But the moment you open the windows and all the light, the external light, the sunlight comes in, it shadows the picture which is on the screen. So all the past impressions are there in our mind. But when we take birth, new birth, when all the five senses are open with which we are interacting with the world, it is just like the light, the senses, the awareness, this present awareness is flooding in and is not allowing us to be aware of that impressions of the past. It just overshadows them. So that's why even you will find that those who regress to the past birth, what's the process? The process is to calm down the mind. Sit down, close your eyes, relax. The moment you come, if you, even if you watch the TV, that there are some shows. I don't know how much authentic it is, but the procedure you will find is this, is this that wherever there is some something which is done, know it for certain, some truth must be there behind it. We can imitate only the truth. So behind all those shows, the phenomenon, the procedure you will find is what? If someone is asked to lie down on a couch or relax, close the eyes, and then we'll find he's asked just to just calm down. And then uh, to certain extent, the one who is uh, trying to regress to the past, hypnotizes to him so that his mind goes very calm, becomes very calm, and then he starts regressing to the past. So these uh, ideas are there in the Yoga Sutras. So you regress to the past, you can see. Otherwise, the present life is just clouding. Is, is the present awareness is so much that we are, our interaction with the world is making our present awareness so intense that it overshadows all those past in images or impressions. So we don't know, but they are there. When you get favorable circumstances, this simply manifest. How it manifests? Suppose I have tasted some delicacy today and I forgot about it. I am busy with the life, I forgot about the delicacy. And now you are passing through the street and you just suddenly pass by that restaurant or that shop, that sweet meat shop, where you purchase that sweet. And seeing that sweet meat shop, immediately the samskara, which was hidden, you forgot because you are busy with the world. And suddenly, getting the favorable circumstances, that impression comes to your mind. That's what happens with us. So they are there. Samskaras come back as a memory only when there are favorable circumstances. So here also the same thing happens. The favorable, getting the favorable circumstances, all the arrangements, which was all already made by the previous person, this man who had the samskara comes and sits and immediately it takes him to that 
spiritual realization. So that's the thing which has been indicated. So uh, then, then the next uh, things again, uh, the discussion continues with the suicide after the vision of God. A devotee, I am frightened to hear of the suicide. Master, suicide is a heinous sin, undoubtedly. A man who kills himself must return again and again to the world and suffer its agony. Because our existence is not this physical body. Our real existence is in the mind. You know, scriptures, they say, this physical body in relation to the mind, how it is like? Just the way our nails grow. Our nails grow, we pair them off, again it grows. Similarly, the Shukshma Sharira is the real body from which, like nails, this Thula Sharira comes, birth after birth. In this birth, we pair it off from the Sukshma Sharira, which is a real body, to which another Thula Sharira comes. So when you are killing this body, or with all the past samskaras, the real uh, so-called uh, entity, which is results in your reincarnation, the Shukshma Sharira is still there. So again, I have to take birth. I cannot run away from life. So if I have to kill, I have to kill the mind. Spirituality is nothing but the killing of the mind. In Yoga Sutra, the second sutra itself speaks of that. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Chitta Vritti Nirodha. It's very, very significant. Chitta Vritti. The word Vritti in Sanskrit actually means profession. It doesn't mean the waves of the mind. It means profession. But we translate it as the waves of the mind, as the thought waves. Then why the word which means profession has been translated as the thought waves? Very interesting. This Sanskrit language is very interesting. You'll see that our profession sustains us. A doctor, by being a doctor, sustains himself. An engineer, by being an engineer, sustains himself. A teacher, by being a teacher, sustains himself. Politician, whoever, whatever, their profession sustains them. How the mind is sustained? By the thought waves. If you can somehow restrict, Nirodha means to restrict the thought waves, the mind is no more there. And when the mind is no more there, as we always give the example, the mind is like a prism through which when the white light passes, it breaks into the spectrum of seven colors. Similarly, the conscious principle, when is in association with the mind, the conscious principle itself breaks into the spectrum, into this world of name and form. But actually, this world of name and form is a projection of the consciousness, which is my real identity. If I can get rid of the mind, just if you can remove the prism, the spectrum merges with the white light. And then you realize your real spiritual identity. And then you realize this world is a mere projection. The reality is that spiritual consciousness. So entire spiritual practice is to realize that, to get rid of the prism, even for the time being, if I can get rid of it. And then I realize the spectrum is merging in that white light, in the white, in the conscious principle. So to get rid of the prism, to get rid of the mind, is the entire spiritual journey. So if you have to commit suicide, that I'm disgusted with the life, with this world, have to, through meditation, go to that state of nirvikalpa samadhi, where the mind collapses and takes you to the realization that you are the self. And just by killing the body, we guys continue to suffer. The same mind is there. Sometimes the suffering is intense more intense. Why? Just we will give an example that why suicide results in more terrible agony, more suffering. Suppose you are having a meal, a delicate a delicacy, and the one with whom you're sitting and having your meal, you start some conversation and suddenly it converts into a debate and you get terribly angry and you get disgusted. You just simply uh, push your plate, get up and just move away from there because you're angry. 
but you are enjoying the meal. The moment you go, as you are not yet satiated, you, has, you really had the desire to have it. Now you're, you will find the moment you leave, your desire, your craving is still more now. Just at the spur of the moment being angry, you just threw the plate and went. But immediately after that, you find that I am really hungry. I really want that the craving for the dish I was having that has become more intense. And when your craving is intense, you will find what happens that when I am hungry, I don't judge for the food. When I am not intensely hungry, I can just think whether to have the delicacy or not. <laughs> when I am starving for days together, whatever I will get, I will have. I will uh, just uh, try to grab and have have it. And that happens with the person who commits suicide. His life was yet to be. His all the desires, which he was supposed to uh, fulfill in this life, was not fulfilled. It was suddenly shut, cut short. And now his craving becomes intensely, intensely intense. And then what happens? Now, as for our tendencies, we to a certain extent do have the choice of birth. Just the way when you are uh, not terribly hungry, you can think whether to have this or that. When you're terribly hungry, you don't have any, your discrimination doesn't work. Whatever you will have, you will grab it. So when we have uh, completed our life in a natural course, in the next birth, we are going to have birth. We, to a certain extent, have that discrimination. Where, as per my tendencies, I am going to take birth. It is taking me, but my cravings are not that intense. So I, to a certain extent, go for the proper birth. But the, because for a man who has committed suicide, the cravings are intense. He, whatever, wherever he will get chance, he immediately goes and takes birth. And he doesn't know the circumstances and anything. And then again, the suffering can be more intense. Most probably the circumstance in which he is born was not at all suitable. It was not at all the thing he was deserving. But because of his tremendous craving, he simply blindfoldedly just resorted to that physical body. And now again, he has to continue with the suffering. Most probably more suffering. So in no way, that's why suicide is considered as a heinous sin. For a spiritual realized soul, there is no more desire. There is no question of taking birth. He can leave the body. But the one who has the desire and has not been fulfilled, for him, the next birth can be more, more, he may result in more suffering. And that's why suicide is considered as a heinous sin. Undoubtedly, a man who kills himself must return again and again to the world and suffer its agony. But I don't call it a suicide if a person leaves his body after having the vision of God. No more desires. Nothing is them to drag him down. There is no harm in giving up one's body that way. After attaining knowledge, some people give up their bodies. After the gold image has been cast in the clay mold, another example he's giving. You may either preserve the mold or break it. Its purpose has been done. Some may preserve it thinking that it will be of use for to someone else. That's what the spiritually, uh, uh, those avatars, the prophets do. That they have no purpose to continue with their life. They are all spiritually illumined. But because of unconditional love, they keep the mold. They don't break it. They keep the mold so that through that, it can serve, it can help the humanity to show the way out. So that's why they may either preserve those who have, those who have that unconditional love as Sri Ramakrishna gives that example, three friends were passing through a street. They saw a very uh, huge wall. And they managed to get a ladder to climb up the wall to see what's there on the other side of the wall. So they managed a ladder. So they kept the uh, ladder against the wall and one of the three friends got up. The moment he reached the top of the wall, he was high, very ecstatic. He was laughing and he was shouting in joy and laughing. The other two were asking, what that you see on the other side that makes you so ecstatic? But he didn't have the even the uh, patience to reply to the friend's question. He was so tempted that he simply jumped to the other side without replying to the friend's question. 
So the second friend, he got up. He also made the same fate. He couldn't reply. He simply jumped. He saw the mirth of joy on the other side and he felt so much tempted, he simply jumped. The third friend got up. He also felt like jumping. He saw the mirth of joy. The world doesn't know it. When he has gone to the top, he sees the other side of the existence with the mirth of joy, the bliss. He also feels like jumping, but he restrains himself. He feels if I jump, no one will be there to relate this experience to the world. It's on this side of the world. So he, out of his compassion, love for the humanity, he restrains himself, <coughs> comes down. This is avatarana, coming down. <coughs> That's the meaning of the word avatara, coming down, avatarana. He comes down so that he can relate that there is another side of the existence. So those who come down, they preserve. But and the others, they may break it. They are, they are not, all are not having the same power. The, some get so much overwhelmed by the ecstasy of that bliss. They don't have the power to restrain and come back. They simply give up. But for them also, the purpose of life has been served. They have attained the spiritual goal. No more desires for this worldly life. So whether you preserve or you break, it depends on the capacity of the soul or as per the divine mission. If the divine, if the divine wants that through you, it is going to do work, it will somehow uh, help you. It will somehow force you to continue with your life. As we find Swami Vivekananda in his last time, in his last days used to say that when I wanted to uh, get absorbed in Nirvikalpa Swamadhi. Sri Ramakrishna told me again and again that I, you have to do a lot of work, mother's work. I was not willing and he told the I will sit in your shoulders and make you do. And I do feel that someone has was sitting on my shoulder and making me do all the things which I have done. So it is the divine who wills. If he wills that through you some work has to be done, even after realization, the mold may be preserved or it may be broken, but its purpose has been served. That's the thing. So after attaining knowledge, some people give up their bodies. After the gold image has been cast in the clay mold, you may either preserve the mold or break it. Many years ago, a young man of about 20 used to come to the temple garden from Varanagar. His name was Gopal Shen. In my presence, he used to experience such intense ecstasy that Rida had to support him for fear he might fall to the ground and break his limbs. The young man touched my feet one day and said, Sir, I shall not be able to see you anymore. Let me bid you goodbye. A few days later, I learned that he went up his body. So the same thing that he has realized. So now, he, he, whether he continue or he gives up his body. The purpose has been served. There is no harm in such death. So that's the thing Sri Ramakrishna is indicating. Four classes of men. Next to the, the thing which Sri Ramakrishna is discussing. It is said that there are four classes of human beings. The bound, the aspiring uh, after liberation, the liberated, and the ever perfect. So bound is the buddha, the one who is aspiring for liberation is the mumukshu, the liberated is the mukta, and the ever perfect is nitya mukta. There are few beings who never get bound. And Sri Ramakrishna, with an example, will describe these four types of men. For example, this world is like a fishing net. Men are the fish, and God, whose maya has created this world, is the fisherman. When the fish are entangled in the net, some of them try to tear through its meshes in order to get their liberation. They're like the men striving after liberation. But by no means, all of them escape. Only a few jump out of the net with a loud splash. And then people say, ah, there goes a big one. In like manner, three or four men attain liberation. Again, some fish are so careful by nature 
that they are never caught in the net. Some beings of the ever, uh, some beings of the ever perfect class, like Narada, are never entangled in the meshes of worldliness. Most of the fish are trapped, but they are not conscious of the net and of their imminent as imminent death. No sooner are they entangled than they run headlong, net and all, trying to hide themselves in the mud. They don't make the least effort to get free. On the contrary, they go deeper and deeper into the mud. These fish are like the bound men. They're still inside the net, but they think they're quite safe there. A bound creature is immersed in worldliness, in woman and gold, having gone deep into the mire of degradation. But still he believes he's quite happy and secure. The liberated and the seekers after liberation look on the world as a deep well. They do not enjoy it. Therefore, after the attainment of knowledge, the realization of God, some give up their bodies, but such a thing is rare indeed. So again, as a continuation, that a few do have realized they give up their body. So this example is wonderful, that in the fish, when the fisherman has thrown his net, some of the fishes, they are very clever. They, can, they always somehow escape. They, they never fall in the net. But all those who have fallen off the net, so a few of them will be trying to get out of the net. But mo most of them won't succeed. A few may succeed. So just jump out of the net. The rest are trying, but they cannot. But the majority, they don't, won't even try. They, along with the net, dive, go deep into the waters, thinking that nothing has happened to them. And they don't know that in no time, the fisherman will be pulling them, and that will be the resulting in their death. So what it's speaking of, this world of, that he's saying, this net is this world of woman and gold. Again and again in the gospel we find these two, Kamini, Kanchan, woman and gold. It actually means lust and gold or wealth. You see, these are the two things which are necessary. How they bind us, they're necessary. Lust, without lust we cannot think of propagation of life. Without wealth we cannot think of sustaining of life. If you don't have wealth, how can I sustain myself? Without lust, how can life be continued? What a necessity. But how it becomes the cause of our bondage, our mind is having this limitation. What's the limitation of the mind? That whatever today I do out of necessity, I go on doing it out of necessity, and a path is created. This is a neuroplasticity. It is what I do again and again, again and again. A path is created. The moment the path is created, I forget the necessity. Just to do it becomes my obsession. I love, I forget uh, the necessity. And you will find this Kamini Kanchan is the biggest obsession, the necessity. But by pursuing it again and again, lives together, through entire process of evolution, from a micro pill, the human being, these are the pursuits, all are doing. That propagation of life, life lust is there, in human beings, wealth is there, but in other creatures, the wealth finds expression as food. We, with our wealth, what we do? We buy our food. So this food and lust. This is a necessity, but this has become an obsession. How much, how obsession? You open a newspaper, you go to any news channel, just look at the crime, behind all the crime, these are the two reasons, nothing else. Either you will find it is some uh, this uh, wealth or something related to lust, Kamini Kanchan. So what has happened? The necessity has become an obsession. And that is taking us, degrading us, taking, binding us, making us do all sorts of things, unwanted things. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. They, most of us think that we are quite happy in this and that is resulting in more and more deeper entanglement. A bee came to sip the honey, sat on the honey, and its wing got stuck in the honey. That was what happened to us. 
a few understands that what our destiny will be if we are simply chasing after the desires of life. The desires are there to fool us. That how you just see the nature of any desire. Can we ever fulfill them? No. They are the nature's way to fool us. See, when any desire is fulfilled, immediately we feel tremendously happy. But does that happiness stay, that ecstasy stay? No. Immediately you will find it has gone. And then again there is a craving. When there is a craving, do you ever remember that after some time it will be gone? No, I always remember the ecstasy. And I find happiness in more in anticipation than in the act itself. What it all speaks of, the nature is forcing us somehow to sustain itself. It is forcing us by showing us that you are going to get bliss, that momentary bliss. And we are in this hedonistic treadmill. You know the treadmill, in the gym you go, you are running, but you are running in the same place. So all our sensed pleasures are like this treadmill. We are thinking that we are going to achieve it, but we are in the same place. The desire is fulfilled, again it comes. Fulfilled, again it comes. Life after life. There is no satiation. It is a hedonist trick. Swami, in the words of Swami Vivekananda, ever running, never reaching. Nor a distant glimpse of shore. It's only the wise who realize this, that what I, we are chasing after, illusion. And then that retreat comes, then attempt to get rid of it comes. So these are the ones who are mumukshu. But all don't succeed. It needs a lot of endeavor. A few succeed. The remaining are trying. Maybe not in this life, in some other life. Again, uh, they may succeed. So that's what, and a few are there. They're the Nitya Siddhas, like Narada. But Nitya Siddhas are also the soul who most probably previously were Buddha, were bound, and they became Mumukshu. They were having that earnestness to attain freedom. And after attaining freedom, they become Nitya Siddha. They don't fall into the bound, into the snares of illusion again. Even if you read the life of Narada, it's like that. He was actually an orphan. He was uh, his mother. Uh, he was born to a uh, this parents. His father is father was not there. The mother, the he was the widow, brought up the child, and his mother, as a widow, used to serve the uh, saints. Whatever the saints after having food, that's how in the Bhagavatam it's mentioned that whatever food used to remain, he used to take that by his association with the holy food and with as monks, gradually, he also developed the tendencies, devotional tendencies. And when his mother passed away, then he got the chance to really dive deep into the spiritual practices that took him to the realization. And after realization, there is no more birth. Now, he is always in the communion with the divine, helping others also to attend that state through eternity. He is traveling through galaxies to help others. So now he is Nitya Siddhya. No one can bound him. But yes, there was a time he was just also an ordinary soul. And then he became Mukta and then he became Nitya Siddha. So that's the idea Sri Ramakrishna is speaking of. So once why after speaking of all those things again he is going back to that previous discussion that what? That after that if you are bound you of course have no right to willingly give up your body. If you are a mumukshu, then also you don't have the right to give up your body. You have the right to give up your body. You have, you have the license to do that. Once you have become either a mukta or nitya mukta, of course the question of giving up the body doesn't come. So this is the thing which Sri Ramakrishna with, high, nice, with the help of this uh, allegory is explaining this four states of existence, but the bound, the mumukshu, the one who is intensely desiring for liberation, and the mukta, the liberated, and the one who is nitya mukta, who is never gets bound. So these nitya siddhas, so they are the ever free. So this, this is with this parable, he's explaining that. So you'll find this discussion is very, very uh, uplifting. What Sri Ramakrishna is having this conversation with Vijay, 
the why he is having these conversations with Vijay, this uplifted conversation, because Vijay belongs to that. He is also the one in whom you will find later in his life shows that that all the tendencies, some scars are hidden. He must have done uh, some lot of austerities in the previous birth. That is there is the in a good samskaras that has enabled him to take birth in a very good family, noble family, the family of the Advaita Acharya. That's one of the uh, companions of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then uh, we find that gradually all those devotions are manifesting. So Sri Ramakrishna finds that he is the one who is uh, having the potential to attain that highest spiritual goal in this very life. After passing of, uh, away of Sri Ramakrishna, we do, do find Vijaya in that exalted spiritual state, going in Samadhi, ecstasy. He also had a lot of devotees. Sri Ramakrishna could see, he could scan the uh, human psyche and accordingly he would give this instruction. This such high, exalted, sublime instructions you won't find. Sri Ramakrishna speaking to others. He's speaking to Vijay because he found that he is the receptacle who can absorb these teachings. These teachings are meant for him. So as we go further, we will find that Sri Ramakrishna's conversation with the with Vijay Goswami is really uplifting. The remaining the remaining portions we will continue in the succeeding classes uh, uh, as and when we have the class on the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So with this, we stop our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskar.